Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Personable. Today I'm honored to be joined by Drew Neiser. Uh, did I say that right? You did. Amazing. Enabling uh, you to learn from the world's best to enable you to become the best that you can be. Um, I feel hugely honored to be joined by someone like Drew today. Drew is uh, the epitome of being an expert within your field. He founded CMO Huddles in 20, 2020, helping B2B marketers. He is a coach for a handful of CMOs that he takes every quarter. He is also the po host of his own podcast called Renegade Mar Marketers Unite. And, and is someone that I look up to and hopefully getting my podcast uh, to somewhat to his sort of size um, one day. He has also hosted an ad age column for 10 plus years, is the author of two books and has done a huge amount in the field. Um, so thank you so much, Drew, for joining me today. I can't believe we didn't mention the one thing that we have directly in common, which in addition to being pot, we're both dookies. I know. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted that to come in later <laughs> on, but uh, I've, every past you guessed, I've been naming that as the first thing. So I wanted to, wanted to save it, but thank you Got very it. much. For, All right. Well, I've already blown that blown the surprise yeah. so uh, thanks I mean, for also, doing it yeah you're also on the the new york board for for duke and on tons of other boards for duke so on top of that that the cherry on the top right there um but drew i wanted to get started off uh, you've got a huge list of accomplishments many of which i've already missed and i was wondering if you could describe who you are what you're doing yeah yeah um so my uh, current title is Penguin in Chief of uh, CMO Huddles, and uh, that uh, is a story in and of itself. Uh, let's start with the fact that a group of penguins is a huddle. Two, that um, B2B marketing, which is my field, uh, tends to be pretty boring. So I wanted to sort of lead by example in this community. So we have a lot of fun with, um, with penguins in uh, CMO Huddles because a group of penguins is a huddle. Get sure. it? There's a the connection. We give 1% of our, our revenue to the Global Penguin Society, by the way. You could even, if you were a member of our community, oh, no, you would also get your very own penguin stress ball. I need one of those. Yes, you do, of course. And wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. And when I record our Tuesday tips, <laughs> I also don my penguin hat. And when you have a really good answer, you get this. Oh, wow. Right. I must be asking great questions, right? Yes, exactly. Hat, hat so anyway, two that's, minutes. Uh, so uh, the, the story is I spend all my time thinking about how CMOs can be better and in inspiring B2B greatness, whether it's in our community or coaching or in the content that I create. So that's sort of, that's me. But sort of being this figure that so many people now look up to, particularly within your field, I was wondering if you could take me on the journey of how you even thought about this, how you even got to this point. Uh, was it your childhood? Was it university? Do you study this sort of thing? How did this even come about? Uh, okay, well, if we went back to Duke for a second, uh, I was really involved uh, in all the, uh, everything that I thought I might want to do, I did at Duke. I did photography for the Chronicle. Um, I uh, shot uh, videos for the cable station. I ran a film series. Uh, I wrote a little bit. Um, what I really enjoyed was running film series and advertising for them. And I produced a lot of ads and, and that was really fun. So when I graduated from Duke, I decided it was either going to be in the film business or in advertising. And I had a relative, uh, actually my grandfather owned an advertising agency in the thirties. Uh, so oh God, that's almost a hundred years ago. Anyway. Uh, uh, so I, I thought the profession might be a good match and that's where I started my career. Um, I ended up running an agency that I started uh, with Indensu um, for 30 years. And that whole thing was simply having done, worked at big agencies was I didn't want to do another agency that was traditional. And I had been trying to find non-traditional marketing for a long, long time. So anyway, Renegade existed because there was a big uh, traditional agency called Gray. And I said, we wanted to be the anti-gray. So that was sort of how Renegade got started. Now I can tell you the connection from Renegade to CMO sure. Huddles if you want. How's that? Yeah, I'd okay. love that. I'd love that. So one of our clients at Renegade, a guy by the name of Pete Kranick, um, started something called the CMO Club. And, and he said, hey, Drew, can you help us out? So we designed the logo and we built their first website. This was probably 15, uh, 16 years ago. And... I needed a way to participate in the CMO huddles, I mean, the CMO, CMO club, but I, 
I'm not, I was running an agency. I'm a, a vendor. So I decided that I could be of service to the CMOs by starting to write about them. I had no idea where this would lead, but I just started to and become almost like their press agents. I uh, wrote a hundred, did a hundred of those interviews and someone actually, a Duke connection said, Drew, there's a book in there. Sure enough, there was. That was the CMO's periodic table. Did a lot of public speaking for the, for that book. After the second hundred inter, uh, interviews, um, and I'd written for Fast Company and Ad Age, someone said, Drew, why the hell aren't you doing a podcast? And that's when I started uh, the podcast. Um, and then in March, on March 2nd, 2020, uh, my friend Pete Cranick sold the CMO club to Salesforce, which is, you know, most people have heard of Salesforce. And it, the light bulb went off for me because I had invested, gosh, 12 plus years in the CMO club. I had built all these relationships. I built all this knowledge and thought, you know what? It's not going to work at Salesforce. I could just see it. The club was never as good as it should have been for B2B. I could see that too, because I was running the B2B curriculum. I said, all right, let's do it. Let's start it. I'd already started one company. Why not start another? Um, and it's a fulfillment at this point in time. I'm I'm on sort of you know you know in soccer when there's extra time put on sure, at the yeah. end. I'm kind of in that moment in my career, and so this feels like a really extended what do they call it red time. What are they, it extended? Yeah, extra time. For, yeah, extended yeah. time. So that's what the that's what CMO huddles is for me. Extra time. I sort of had uh, two thoughts there. The first being, you know, you, you've got this idea to speak to all these CMOs in the first place prior to you writing that book, but if you know if their minds and are their ideas is what gives them the role in the first place that's what makes them a ceo that what that's what makes them valuable within a business why do you think they're so open in sharing their tactics and strategies to you and uh, allowing other people to also use the same ideas uh it's a good question and i uh, there's there's several motivations but one of the things that uh CMOs really do need to do is, or a lot of them do is, and by the way, for your audience, if they don't know what a CMO is, it's a chief marketing officer. And they are the people who are responsible, not just for the ads, but the whole often go to market strategy for a company. And in B2B, there's a lot. You could end up having sales, some aspect of sales reporting to you, you could have some aspect of internal comms reporting. It's a, it can be a very, very big job. Okay. So back to the question of why would they share? You know, often they're sharing because they their company wants the publicity. So it's a way of extending okay. the value because they're not necessarily sharing anything that you couldn't have figured out on your own. They're not sharing any secrets. And at least in, in the case of my interviews, uh, I never am the guy who breaks news. I'm the one who's doing case history. So it's a year, two years after the fact, yeah. and we have results that we can share. And that's the big thing for me is everything we do. I have this, it's a really almost mean expression, which is I don't care about your opinions. I only care about your experience. And so then we're just yeah. talking about you did this and this is what happened, good or bad. And if you, as long as you stick with that sort of focus, you'll learn so much uh, about what, uh, and, and from each other. And so that's sort of that one of the things that's ingrained into CMO huddles is that you don't conjecture, you don't say, I believe in blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. You did something and it worked or it didn't. <laughs> sure. I mean, let's break it, it down and why did it work or why didn't it work? And what was the sort of the genesis? How did you sell it? Those kinds of things. If you sort of had all these insights, was there any part of you or did anyone ever try and poach you and make you their CMO within their business? Was that ever a, a potential route for you? Uh, you know, I couldn't have done it. And, you know, honestly, I have a pretty wicked ADD and I get bored with one simple thing. That's why I always sure. wanted to be on the agency side is that I needed multiple challenges I could really dig in for three months and focus, and then I need to do something else. Um, and with the, with huddles, it's an endless supply of different challenges. Never do I never have the same conversation twice. You know what? You've worked with some incredible people, uh, including HSBC and uh, sorry, groups including HSBC and Panasonic. I'd be curious on your process. Uh, I haven't actually described what you did with them. So if you could describe what you did and also your sort of process 
for coming up with such revolutionary and incredible ideas. Uh, so let me pause on that one for a second. So HSBC was a client of Renegades and we got to know the one of the heads of marketing for one of the divisions. And this individual was had hired us for some guerrilla ideas and they wanted, they had a very specific challenge. HSBC, which some people know as Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, wanted, had this thing, uh, campaign as the world's local bank, and they wanted to sort of put some New York into the brand. That was our challenge. And, and initially, they had some ideas about how to do this, like handing out you know, things on the street or something like that. And so we went through this process of really getting inside the, the head of the customer and what sort of what would be a service. And this was a mentality that we had or philosophy that we still have which is called marketing as service. The idea is marketing doesn't have to be pollution or noise or irritating. It can actually be valuable, like a podcast, right? You can deliver information in the process you can, you can, build, you can build a brand. So we were thinking about it, and what service could we do that would be remarkable and surprising? And that's how we came up with the HSBC Bank Cab, because cabs are a, very much of a New York iconic thing. We found a checker cab, which was the ultimate icon of New York City, um, and uh, found a driver. We did a search for the most knowledgeable cab driver in New York, which many people thought was an oxymoron at the time. It's not like London cab drivers where they actually are tested. So we had a lot of fun with that, but that program ran for 13 years. And every single time, and it won all sorts of awards for guerrilla marketing. And every time someone got in that cab, they had an incredible experience. And they were like, you know, they called five people and said, you wouldn't believe it. And, you know, something as simple as a free cab ride, but in an old fashioned cab with a knowledgeable cab driver of something. And we built on that. Anyway, so that was an example of, of a program that wasn't a one off that became very much and ended up in their annual report and Time Magazine talked about it and got PR and all these good things. And um, the process was always about knowing the customer. And then, I got to say it's serendipitous. A lot of the ideas over the years that we had at Renegade were a combination of things. You know, we, we you, had a process, but you have to allow for serendipity. They'll just be that moment. Would you ever go to people with these ideas? Like, how would you get your clientele? Was it word of mouth? Would you come up with your own marketing strategies to get clients? No, we how did I that didn't, sort of process work? I didn't like to do that. And it, it's interesting. Sure. There are some who would approach you and say, hey, we have... <laughs> we have a uh, an idea like someone would say hey we want to do this can you find a client for it we never liked yeah. to do it like it was much better if the client had a problem or a challenge then we could come up with a, a sort of a non-traditional way of of solving it it's much better um and 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 you know you're doing something that ends up being um very bespoke and and that's what you know if you're an agency that's what you should be doing so would you find that you'd end up getting referrals to other businesses or just things like the awards would end up bringing in a lot more? Yeah, we got a lot of press. In our heyday as a guerrilla marketing agency, we yeah. got tremendous amount of press. I mean, and we were working with really cool clients, IBM and Nike and, and Panasonic and, and H. And so we, we, you know, we would get press and that sort of that business, certainly at that time, if you got ink, you got more clients. What's your view on how, because uh, I'm only 19 years old and the marketing, even in the past year, it keeps changing every single day. How have you sort of noticed the main sort of general uh, marketing techniques have changed with the advent of social media and AI and all of that? What's your sort of views on, on how it's changed over the years? So it's changed dramatically uh, in so many different ways. And I, you know, one of the things that's very cool about running CMO huddles is that we get to help CMO stay on top of all the change. And so we do um, huddles almost every other month on a latest application of Gen AI. Um, and it means I have to play with the tools and, and I have to stay on top of it. Uh, but I want to say as much as it has changed, the interesting thing is that more digital 
more inter uh, artificial intelligence, where you end up is the same place we did 20 years ago is, do you have a big idea at the core of this thing? And can you sure. execute in a unique way? And it doesn't matter what channel we're talking about. I mean, let's face it. Look, I, you know, you look at the, you look at TikTok, if that's your feed and you go, oh, interesting, cool, right? Something magical happened and it caught your attention. Um, that's creative. Uh, that's still at the heart of this thing. And it's the X factor that so many, for so many years, the goal has always been to program out the X factor. We could just do better digital targeting and we could win. And it's coming back to, no, it looks like the creative is about the only real true leverage that you have. So to sure. me, that's one bit of optimism that exists in our, in, in a, in a business that has changed and gotten really small. <laughs> yeah. The how, like, I, I see what you're saying at the creative side, but I think with everyone now having uh, social media, everyone is now a creative. Um, but I think marketing, uh, you know, everyone's sort of got their own brand pages. It's becoming very saturated. So how could a small business or an entrepreneur or a CMO in perhaps a smaller company that's trying to break through into a market, how do they differentiate dif differentiate themselves in this oversaturated, over-marketed, over-social media used world? Well, we don't have enough time to answer that completely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but I will say uh, a couple of things. Uh, my book addresses it. Uh, I was just reading this book called Standout uh, Startups that I think is pretty good sort of basic. No, I think it's a very good how to differentiate your startup. But to me, it always comes down to is there's an old expression, unique selling proposition. What's your one little kernel that's that unique and you can hang your hat on? And obviously, penguins are not that thing, but penguins are part of our brand. Sure. And we're the only CMO community that has penguins, right? Now, that's no one is going to get that initially, but it's one element. We're also the only one focused on B2B, and we're also the only ones that talk about inspiring B2B greatness. So there are certain things that we've tried to own, and then it's about consistency and repetitiveness and uh, multi-channel. And that's sort of the kind of the way marketing has always worked. And, you know, now it becomes a question of, is it primarily PR? Is it primarily one social channel? Is it, uh, and look, it's not easy to build a brand. It never has been easy to build a brand. Um, now it's because everybody's a brand, it's even harder, right? Sure. It's and very so hard you, to, yeah. you just have a lot of little ones now. Um, it's even harder to build a big one. Yeah, and I think it's there's also a thing of um, with social media. I mean, fake news and things like that. It's quite there's a lot of distrust as well in brands. I mean, a while ago when someone would say something, you'd be more inclined to believe them. But now that there's so many people saying so much, uh, it's quite hard to figure out what's what's true and what's not. So one of the things, that, another thought that occurred to me is is there's something called community led growth. And that's a, that is a marketing strategy. In, the, in other words, you get a small group of people to use your product or service or whatever it is and rally behind you. And you enable them to help your business grow because you're, again, remember that idea of marketing a service. You're helping these folks. You're bringing them together. You're making them better at whatever the problem is your product or service solves. So your Tableau 15 years ago you got a small group of data visualizers together. Literally, their first meeting was 100. By wow. about six years later, they had 10,000 people at their user conference. But those 100 people were so enthusiastic and so committed that they were able to bring other people in. It's not, you know, it's not running a billboard on the freeway that's going to build a brand. It's people who are going to say, God, I like working. I I like working with Harvey or I like working with whatever, you're right? That, that there's a, that they, they feel confident in it. And you're right. In fake news, it gets even harder. So, you know, word of mouth is going to matter even more. Uh, and I do think there will be uh, a few trusted sources and, you know, being there will matter. Yeah. I mean, I am, I can't even remotely pretend that I'm an expert in this field because I'm not at all. But what, one thing I found is a big uh, differentiated, which you kind of, just said is there a, there's a difference between 10,000 
people that see something or 10,000 users that are unenthusiastic, that don't really care about a product, that have seen it just through an advertisement versus having 100 people who care deeply about it. And in a lot of uh, books, people like Peter Thiel have mentioned this in the past, right. about having that first 1,000 users that are enthusiastic, they're going to share it to five friends and help improve it. But I'd be curious um, with your sort of business expertise, if you sort of have found that you sort of build your product and then those sort of people come, or you build, or you build your product according to those thousand people, and sort of how that dynamic changes over time. Yes, <laughs> is the answer. Either way will work. It really sort of depends. Uh, you know that what what you find in the startup world is is that there's this thing called product market fit, and you never really quite know that you have it. And you might go with two directions. I was talking to literally a, a guy at a startup the other day, and he had two products in his portfolio. One which had was a category, new kind of thing, kind of like a new category. And the other was just a better widget, if you will. And sure. they had to make the decision. And you know, growing a category on your own is really expensive and it takes a lot longer. But you know, just having a better widget is, you know, is hard to sustain. So you start to you sort of test your way in uh, from a product standpoint and from a resonance standpoint. The harder part is keeping your ears open so that you really see where the passion lies or lay. Yeah. I don't know. I need a grammarian here. Uh, but that's, well, there used to be these things called focus groups. You'd gather a group of 10 people and you'd ask them for opinion on an ad or a product or service. And you know, my attitude was I only care about the two people who really get into this. Yeah, not 10 random people. Yeah. How, how did you, I'm, I'm particularly curious about when you started building your podcast, how many sort of episodes into it was it that you found this community or did those sort of transfer across from your business? How did you find building community in the sort of social media landscape? Uh, it's, it's such a, a great question and, and one I'm not sure I have a, a, a perfect answer for. I started doing a podcast just because I was doing interviews anyway. That was my reason. I was gonna, I was already interviewing these CMOs because I knew I wanted to get them into ad age or wherever. Uh, but I, I was record and I was recording the interviews. So first thing I did was I recorded 30 episodes of interviews and I found five that I actually liked <laughs> that I thought were yeah. worthy of launching a podcast for. I have eventually used the other 25, but the five were really good and they, they started it. Um, I, I'm going to have to do 10 more before I post this one then. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Whatever works for you. I mean, by the way, most people stop at eight. They do eight podcasts and they never get beyond that. So you're 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 well on your way. Um, part of a when I saw, I mean, I literally didn't have a, an objective, and I've sort of let the podcast take me. I didn't. I wouldn't say there was a community, and then yet. I, I am talking on the phone with CMO and they said, Oh, I was listening to your episode yeah. today. It's like, yes. <laughs> uh, and you know, I, what I get a sense of is when they're listening and what, what resonates with them. Um, and you know, there's somewhat of a brute force to this in that I've been doing it so long. I mean, you know, we're, uh, episode, I don't know, 380 is comes yeah. out or just came out or, uh, and that's a lot of years of episodes, right? And eventually someone looks and goes, well, he's done 380 episodes. I mean, he must be something interesting in there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I've been on lots of lists. That's really important. You know, when CMOs make lists or senior marketers make lists and they mention um, the podcast, that's, that's really how you find an audience. But it's not like I run an episode and I get 500 comments on, that was a great episode. Thanks, Drew. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah, I, I'd sort of echo a lot of those things. Because um, I think in the world of YouTube and things like that, it's best thumbnail, most catchy video, changing the, every few seconds, changing the title to make people as hooked as possible. Um, but I was listening to um, a guy called Ali Abdal, uh, based in the UK. Uh, he's built up, I think, like 5 million subscribers. Uh, he was a, a medical student at Cambridge University, basically posting study techniques. And he's basically built, he's now built a, a YouTube business um, with 15 people in his team, a very successful podcast. And one of the things he was saying on the podcast and why he does it and why it's so valuable 
even though it gets a tenth of the views as his YouTube videos, is he says the people that listen to those podcast episodes, he finds a 50, if not 100 times more valuable than the, than the people that will just watch a singular YouTube video. Because instead of them going, watching a 10 minute clip and then running off to something else, right. you are in their ear for an hour. And yeah. in that hour, you, they feel like you're almost a God like figure to them in the sense that you are what is playing in their mind. And I'm not saying I'm trying to have control over people in any way. And in fact, it's the opposite. But I think the connectivity to a community and to an audience to really be able to teach them things while also learn from them, I think is unbelievably invaluable. Well, I, I will say uh, two things for you to think about is today it is a little bit about your niche. And I have a very small niche of, I mean, there are only f like 4,000 B2B CMOs in, I don't know, the US or uh to begin with. And, you know, yes, there are a lot of other marketers, but that's my target is this group of folks. Um, I think the, the real joy of this is how much you get to learn and the privilege of learning. Now, the yeah. one thing that I, I, I've sort of come to realize that a podcast host does, and, and I think you're doing that very well too, is my job is to help the listener digest what he's hearing from the other guest. So sometimes that means just repeating what they said, right? Because remember, they're listening while they're walking around, they're, they're exercising, they're on their treadmill, whatever it is. So be the person to digest it. And one thing that CMOs have told me that they like is, I challenge and based on what I've heard from somebody else, and I try to put it into context that I think others will be able to understand. And that's an art form that you can bring to it again. I don't think I did that in the first five or 10 episodes, but as I've gotten better at this, I think, again, I don't know. Um, I, I seem to be able to help the listener digest better and put it into a framework. Sure. Have you found um, this podcast? I know you initially didn't have a goal from this. You were talking about being an extra time. I, I don't think you're an extra time yet. I think you've still got some game time. <laughs> um, but have you found that this has been uh, an extremely helpful pipeline uh, into the coaching business and the community business that you're building alongside it? Uh, the, the answer is yes, unequivocally. unequivocally. But that's, not, again, not where I started. It was a night. Yeah. And by the way, the first hundred or so, maybe even 200 episodes, I don't think we, maybe I got one client out of it for Renegade. Now, for CMO Huddles, it's a great pipeline. Yeah. It's a great pipeline. And because part of one of the pillars of CMO Huddles, I mean, we have three sort of core tenants. One is that will will give you control on your job through the content. And it's a job that's very hard to have any control. So the content and the, the way it's all designed is to help a CMO do their job uh, as well as they possibly can. That's control. Another thing that is connectivity is to connect with everybody, right? And connect with the community. And that's another benefit. But that's pretty standard for communities. Our secret sauce is coverage in the PR that yeah. we generate. So if someone comes in the door and their press person says, hey, our, they, our CMO wants to be on your show, they've come to me to talk about what they've been doing. And at that moment, I've earned the right to sort of say, hey, by the way, CMO huddles, right? And, and so and because they are interested in publicity and we build that in, and I wanted to tell you one other thing that was kind of fun that we didn't do right away. We, um, as part of CMO Huddles, we came up with these Tuesday tips that we record at the end of CMO. Those are now standalone podcast episodes within Renegade Marketers Unite. Wow. So every Tuesday, there's like a three minute uh, podcast that comes out within our series. And that's proved to be great for expanding our audience because it's bite sized, bite -sized digestible sampling of that. It hasn't hurt our downloads or, or uh, of the whole episodes. And because they're not snippets of the, of the whole thing, they're their own thing. And so there's an expectation, oh, if I'm listening to a Tuesday tip on Renegade Marketers Unite, it's, that's what it's going to be. This, this might sound like a very ludicrous question, um, because I think for me, from my point of view, again, not an expert, um, it seems that being a marketer, you're successful if you're able to convert the the impression that basically the person's seeing something and convert them into a user or to like a post 
whatever that's success from my point of view but do you see any danger uh, in the way this is going is as you said something being very successful is increasingly smaller increasingly bite-sized pieces of information and consumers are starting to get things in an instant tiktok videos are only 10 seconds long bite-sized people content people aren't listening to five hour long tv series or movies or whatever anymore people are now trying to get 10 second little clips do you think there's any danger in, in the eyes of someone a cmo or a marketer or is that not something you think needs to even be thought about well we had a video expert a uh, guy tyler lassard from which one of the vidyard and he did talk about the need to get attention quickly like getting right into uh the, and this is particular to video um i don't think it's the case with audio i don't think there's any proof that a short episode yeah. is a long episode look if it's boring it's boring period but if it's interesting um it it's interesting so with video itself again it depends on the where you are but look if you're looking for a training video on how to use HubSpot better, you're not going to watch a five second video. You're going to dive in. Yeah. So what we're really talking about is, is you're competing against entertainment in everything that you do, right? And so if you're business to business and you're trying to educate, you got to figure out a way to, and this is just better communication. This is designing your, maybe you have to have a better hook than you did before. But again, I, you know, I don't think that uh, just because um, everybody's watching five second videos on, on uh, YouTube or, you know, TikTok, that it's the death of long form media at all. I, I, I disagree with that premise. I mean, you look at long form television still doing fine. Um, series are still doing fine. Movies are still doing fine. Audio books are doing great. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think, I, I think my I think what I'm uh, saying more is is in how we're feeding people content. I think I'm, I'm more asking just more of a general question in terms of brands constantly feeding people short term content because it's working well, and whether that presents a danger in feeding them the content or just because it's working well, we should continue doing it. That's sorry, yeah, that's more what I'm. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think it really depends on on the situation. I don't. Look, your first role of marketing, you have to get someone's attention, right? You're competing for mind space and you're competing for yeah. mind space against everything, not just, uh, you know, your, your message versus your competitor's message. It's everything. So you have to know right now, you really have to understand where you are, the context of, of, of where you are, right? And how, how you're presenting in order to do it. But I, I, I think if you're asking, are there metrics like plays or views or something that are misleading because you have these bite-sized ones? Yeah, probably. That, that could be very misleading information because you're just, you, you get this much. But I will tell you that if you create a video on your website and you're selling a you know, $50,000 enterprise system and someone watches it to the end, you know damn well that person is interested in buying your product or service. Right. I wanted to go uh, even deeper uh, into the topic of um, marketing. Um, well, perhaps this isn't that much deeper, but looking at uh, back on your career and speaking to younger people, people in, in my sort of generation that want to become a CEO or want to get into marketing, what do you think are the best steps for them to reach the role of a CMO? Is it about getting the experience, these skills you acquire, are these, is this just being a genius and being able to come up with these incredible ideas like yourself? What's the sort of pathway for something like that? Born or made? Uh, yeah, so what's so interesting about this, so I have a good friend, um, uh, Alan Hart, who has another podcast called Marketing Today. He's another guy who's got close to 400 episodes and he's interviewed mainly CMOs, but he does both B2B and B2C. And he and I were talking the other day and I said, so is there one path to being a CMO? And it's like, it's a joke because no, there isn't. Um, it's not like med school. And, and that's a strength and a weakness. I mean, it, because people come up through product, engineering, uh, sales, some come up through marketing. And so that 
part, again, it's a good and a bad because they don't all know the same aspects of marketing when they finally get up to the top. And so they're always going to have holes in their experience uh, for the most part. So one is there is no path per se. I will say that generally the CMO role at a larger company is a leadership role, not a marketing role. So that means you've established yourself as a leader of, of folks. Um, I can't recommend the book Impact Players enough. This woman, Liz Weissman, wrote it. I'd read it in college for sure. So you understand what it means to be. And what's so great about that book is it doesn't matter what you do. This woman starts as a receptionist at Hill Holiday and ends up being the president because the president of Hill Holiday at the time, it's a Boston-based agency, said to her, you are the CEO of our office entryway. <laughs> own it. And she got it. She did. She made something of the job. And I think that that notion is so profound right now, as I know so many folks, including my kids, want to live a purpose-driven life, purposeful life. And I think there's a lot to be said for taking advantage of whatever opportunity you have and doing the best you can at that. And things just happen. And, and there was another story in her book that I loved. It's about a young lady who wanted to be an actress, but couldn't get work. So she ended up working for another actress and it was like, ended up being her assistant and then taking care of their house, got to know her husband. Next thing you know, they're doing a podcast. And she's become a, one of the top podcasters in the, in the world. We're talking about an indirect path, but everything she did was, was just to the max. She committed. Uh, and I, I think that that route will lead you to a leadership role a lot faster than planning. <laughs> I need to do this. Yeah. I need to do this. I need to do this. Um, you need, yeah. if you, kill it, kill it wherever you go. Yeah. I, I think that can, I, particularly to myself uh, and in my family members know that I always like to plan well in advance, but I think the sort of system is quite tough as well. I mean, in the UK, uh, you take these things called GCSEs, which would be in the equivalent of your uh, sophomore year in high school. Right. Uh, and you take maybe 11 subjects. So that's very rigid. And then you take A-levels, which would be three or four in your senior year. And then you'd go to university. And unlike in the US, where it's liberal arts and get to explore, you're going in for one subject. So there's almost this view in the work world as well that you've got something else to work up to. You've got into a good school. You've got into a good university. You get into a good job. What's next? What's next? What's next? Whereas now, what I'm sort of seeing is that people are starting to change jobs um, every two to three years. Everything's sort of changing. So it's this sort of you know, massive contrast in our minds of this stable path, which may not actually even exist anymore. Um, yeah, I don't think there is a stable path. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying do anything and stay anywhere long uh, uh, because of that. I think the difference, though, is I see people at a company that's doing something interesting that is being successful and not taking it and not pushing whatever it was they were to be the best, whatever that was they were supposed to be to see where that'll go. Because if you think about a career, it's you were assembling a group of cheerleaders or not. You were assembling a group of mentors or not. And if you don't take advantage of every job and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to help these people that they, they were nice enough to give me a job, uh, I'm going to help uh, these folks as much as I can and figure it out. And I am honestly saying, I did not get this early in my career. I did not understand this. This is on the list of books I wish somebody had handed me at 22 because I could have, I really, and, and maybe I simply wasn't ready for it at that time. But it's just getting beyond your what you think you need and getting to, I'm here and I'm just going to really make the most of it and see where it goes. And so I think that the job hopping, and you know, I've seen it a lot where they hop to, for example, I'm going to go work for a nonprofit because that sounds right. But they don't do their diligence on the nonprofit. It finds out that it's yeah. just as political as a for-profit organization, but no money. <laughs> yeah. And ultimately, what you really want to do is just work for really accomplished individuals who know what they're doing. 
you know, and I was really lucky at, at J. Walter Thompson when early in my career to work for some just incredibly, you know, af- effective leaders and people who really taught me tremendously. Uh, and that was, you know, that was time well spent. How, how do you, and what do you tell your kids? How do you even go about finding these people? Because it's different than people's reputation and how good people say they are versus actually working for them and how good they are. Again, I think you sort of, uh, you look, you're going to pursue things that you think you're interested in. We know that, right? You're going to just do it. You're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to try like my case. I wanted to get into, in, in, unless you go to law school or business school or, or, or whatever, a graduate something, you're going to narrow it down to a couple areas and then you're going to throw out as many, you know, try to get it in the door for job number one. Once you're in job number one, you start to see, oh, I'm good at this. I'm not good at that, but I can fix those things. I like this. I'm inspired by this. I like what that person is over doing over there. And you figure out how to get there, how to help them. How to have, I mean, you know, your generation is all about a side hustle. It's a side hustle at work. Find a side hustle there that inspires you. Could you, um, could you elaborate on that a little bit more about what you mean about, because a lot of people, it's like, just do the job, go home. What do you mean yes. about making, yeah, what do you mean? So, you know, part of it is, and again, this is with the, you know, I've been in the, out of school and worked a long, long time. And so it's, there's more perspective than I would have had it at, at 22. But had I could have had <laughs> this perspective, it was yeah. like, how does the business make money? How can I help the business? What are the purpose of this business? Whatever it is, right? And how does my job connect to that? Because almost every business is about acquiring customers and keeping them, right? You're on one of those two things. Now, if you're in the keeping the customer business, what's that look like? How do you measure it? How do you impact that? How do you get better at it? Who in the organization is better at it? Getting to know your customers and going, oh, I'm the only guy talking to the customer right now. I could be a feedback loop or there's a disconnect from here to here. You see a problem in the organization and it has nothing to do with your job, but it's inhibited. You go to someone and say, you know what? I'd love to help you on this project. Sure. I see what you're saying. So it's more about like double downing on connectivity to the business. Not, not even so that other people can see that you're doing the work. That's a bonus right. but about gaining the skills that you need to hopefully get the role that you want later down the line. Yeah. And you don't even know what that role is necessarily. It's, yeah. That's the thing that's so interesting. And there's a little bit of, of, it's a leap of faith because you're basically saying, I don't know where this is going to go, but I do know that if I do an extraordinary job in this role and add a little bit more here, something good's going to happen. And, and that is the leap of faith. And it almost doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I mean, in law, you go to law school, you, and then you try to build 2000 hours. <laughs> And then you hope you don't piss off a partner. And at seven years or nine years, you become a partner. That's, I don't know if that's a career path that a lot of people want. And, and there aren't other career paths that are very well defined anymore. Everything else is, you got to go make it. <laughs> and it's exciting because you don't have to worry about it. You just have to do a great job wherever you are. With these um, sort of skills that you've mentioned, obviously, a lot of different jobs, a lot of different roles. Um, I'd be curious if you found if there are any common characteristics or categories of CMOs, especially those that are successful versus not, not successful. Funny enough, that's exactly what my book is about. <laughs> you didn't know you a you know, Thank you. Thank you for that. for that. So different animal, uh, the acronym is CATS. Uh, and it stands for courageous, artful, thoughtful, and scientific. And I sort of, again, I, when I drilled it down and looked at what were the components of a successful chief marketing officer, they had the courage um, to sort of focus. They had the courage to be distinct because most companies sort of say, oh, what's our competitor doing? Okay, we'll do that, right? You have to dare to be different. Um, it takes courage to stand out because it's just, and, and to stand up and, and try to get an organization to be green when everybody in the category is yellow, right? It's just hard and, it, and that takes courage. Uh, and it is absolutely a number one characteristic that I have seen among successful marketers. 
The next part is artful. And what artful is about is not that you're necessarily individually creative, but that you are able to assemble a group of people and bring them together and help the ideas come to fruition. And you don't get in the way of it. Um, there's a certain amount of empathy that goes into that, a certain amount of listening skills, um, and uh, that you recognize this is where the the skill of marketing that you understand how brand works and color works and design works and all of that, that's in this artfulness. Um, thoughtful is this notion that the whole marketing and service, this whole idea that marketing can be a force of good and do good things for customers, prospects, uh, and employees. Because uh, if your employees don't believe in a brand, no one will. And then scientific is the last, the S. And this is the key thing in all of this. You can be courageous, you can be artful, you can be thoughtful and still fall flat on your face because you don't have basic math and science behind you supporting what it is that you're doing. Because marketing is not just, oh, pretty pictures and oh, it's nice, a new logo. It's about doing something for the business, right? Acquiring customers, keeping customers, pretty much that and uh, employees and, you know, all those other good things. So. That's um. Those are the four characteristics. Cats. Stunning. Ta -da. Um, <laughs> particular reason I wanted to wanted to speak to you and and what I find incredibly interesting is I think in today's world I've mentioned social media quite a lot, but I think everything nowadays is marketable, including yourself and your own brand. Um, but one thing in terms of building up my own knowledge, just like you with the podcast, and whether this leads to anything or not, is the ability to create an incredible network not just to say I've met or spoken to someone, but in enabling myself to learn from, as I call it, the world's best people in their given fields. What experience have you had in building a network? What do you find is the importance of it? And how can others, uh, without a podcast or with, go about doing the same? Yeah, it's a give to get thing. And this is the thing. If you are always saying, what can this person do for me? Your network is going to stay pretty small. But if you think about what can I do for them as, and the thing that you have to remember, you have currency, you have social currency and that uh, you, for example, you and I are having this conversation and you want to keep that relationship going with me. Every once in a while you go on LinkedIn because you know that's my dominant channel and say, hey, Drew, great post, really enjoyed it. Boom. You stayed top of mind. I every will check post, on it. Every single one. Every post, but and not just a <laughs> like, you know, leave yeah. a comment. So. You can't do that against a thousand people, uh, but but you could do it in and you could do it in a thoughtful way, and then you could say, "Huh, is there another student?" Or I know Drew started Demon at, at at Duke. I wonder if there's a Duke student that he would talk to. For example, now you're p paying it forward. You've just connected somebody to me, and I'm going to help them. And so this is where you're proactively looking at the network you build and you're maintaining it. Um, it takes work, but it is a great investment. And for you to be thinking that at 18 is incredible to me. It blows me away. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I found that particularly helpful uh, from the school, from school and university. And I find myself very fortunate in being able to access and talk to some of the most brilliant minds on the planet. Um, and I can't deny that there is a strong amount of privilege being at a university like Duke. But I also am not, I also don't think it's, exclusive to people from good schools in order to build a great network. Have you got any advice for people that haven't gone to these big name schools and how they could also go about approaching people, even if they aren't on their own school's alumni? Yeah. I, I mean, you, you've got to try and you build off a of success, right? Yeah. You, you, it takes the courage to, you know, to figure out what's important to that individual. But the good news is almost everybody that you're looking for is on social somewhere. Right. And that's the difference then from 40 years ago, where you'd have to write someone a letter. <laughs> you'd have to find their address and write them a letter or a cold call them. Now you can engage with their content. And if you do it enough and you do it thoughtfully and you focus it enough and you say, these are the 10 people that I want to meet right now, and you're a student anywhere in this country, I, I guarantee you, at least five of those people that you want to meet will respond in one way or another. Now, yeah, if you're I've trying asked. to meet Taylor Swift, it might be hard. It might be hard, but maybe not. You know, yeah. she's, she's, she supports her people too. She's all about community. Quite, quite a few of them have, uh, have said no, but I, I've reached out to um, 
the president of the United States. They got <laughs> responses from them. I've had responses from past prime ministers of different countries. So even if I, I had a response from Jeff Bezos, so even if they didn't come on, I appreciate at least, you know, the ability that they've seen it and had Harvey Bracken Smith and their, their email for at least five seconds of their lifetime. And um, by the way, this is a long-term game, let's assume you're going to keep doing this. You'll say, you could always say, I understand, you know, that, that this is a, you don't know who I am. So who is it that you would like to see on my show that would convince you to come? It's a very smart idea. So you well, just I say, and one. by the way, I promise to come back to you. Perseverance pays. I mean, I know it's a cliche, but it does. Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll use that one. I've got a few other ones, uh, like those sort of names that have potentially said yes. So I'm not going to expose them just yet. Um, I had, I had another question. Um, I found from my own experience within student organizations, I, I pres presume this would also transfer to the business world, but your business is only really as good as the people working there. Um, have you got any general thoughts or advice, uh, for CEOs, CMOs on building a good team of people, what to look for and how that sort of intertwines with your uh, business and with your message? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and and the the truth is that uh, when I look at who I think the, are some of the the, the most effective um, CMOS in in our community, their building a team is is their number one priority. And you know they come into a job, and there's a certain number of people, and inevitably they need to bring in somebody else. And it, and there's there's so many demands on a CMOS time that if you don't have strong leaders that you can count on running your various departments and initiatives, you're in trouble. You're going to be too busy yeah. doing the work to run it. So, um, and I know there are a lot of people who like to do the marketing and, and are less interested in the leadership aspect. Fine, but recognize the limitation that that will have on, on, on your career. So in terms of hiring, there are a lot smarter, uh, better people who are, uh, have better advice on, on that, it's a complicated, you know, everything from interviewing to building a well-rounded team, not hiring yourself. There's so many other little things that, that go uh, into it. Um, but, you know, one thing is, is for sure is that you don't want to make snap decisions on hiring. Um, and uh, you, you, because if you make a bad hire, it's, it's, it's so difficult to un- you know, to correct that. So, uh, at the old expression, hire slowly, fire quickly is, is, is still, still relevant, but, uh, how to hire effectively. It is remarkable to me, given all the science that we have out there, that it is still a very subjective and ineffective, um, process right now. Yeah, I think I'm uh, my podcast's going to need a new host soon. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> How about just getting a new producer? You know, yeah. Start, yeah. And maybe I'll steal yours. You know, I'll give them okay, perfect. five dollars, five dollars a year. Um, my final question: um, What is one thing uh, that you wish a listener of this podcast uh, to take away from this that you feel like you said or didn't say, uh, and for them to know about you moving forward? I think that the thing that uh, would be nice to take away is that there's this concept of personal brand, and it is something that you as an individual have an opportunity. And I think today, everybody needs to have some awareness of what it means to be a personal brand, and that's marketing, and that's understanding sort of who you are, what gets you excited, what doesn't get you excited, and what can people count on you for? And the sooner you sort of get a handle on that, uh, the more likely you can build a into your personal brand and grow your personal brand. And, and by doing that, you're growing yourself. So it, it's it's a journey, and, and it's it's a wonderful journey. And and I, I guess the last part of this is uh, there's this concept at Duke called forever learning. And it's the biggest blessing uh, that I think anybody can have in life is just to recognize that, you know, you, you read every book in one room, you open up the door and there's another room <laughs> that has more books and more things. And so, you know, life is just a learning adventure. Well, thank you so much, Drew. Um, I feel like I've learned an unbelievably large amount from you t today. Um, I think uh, it's truly fascinating to learn both your journey uh, and from someone that's not 
only uh, you know, just being a CMO within one business. You're actually speaking to, interacting with, helping and you know, winning awards for your incredible coaching and help with lots of different people. And I think that advice is invaluable. Um, I thoroughly enjoy your podcast and uh, it's something that's going to continue motivating me. Hopefully one day I'll reach my 386th or whatever episode. Uh, and if I take anything away from this uh, podcast, I will make sure to like all your LinkedIn posts. Uh, <laughs> So no, thank no, you so don't much. like them. Celebrate them or say that you're inspired. A like is very low currency. All right. Oh. Harvey, I appreciate you and I appreciate what you're doing. It's amazing. I know how much work it takes to do a podcast. So kudos to you uh, and, uh, you know, forever Duke.